There's an older woman sitting in her house. She's lived a, a long life. Now she's 90 plus years old. She looks back on her life. Her husband is still alive, older than her. He's been a strong and successful man. They've been married for a long time. They've accumulated lots of stuff over their lifetimes, as we all know can happen. They've built this life together, and they've accomplished many things. They've been through ups. They've been through downs. There's some memories. There's some crossroads they faced that they made it through. But there's one thing they've never had that's a child of their own. It's something she wanted, something he wanted, but just not in the cards for them. It was medically impossible, the doctor said. One night, in vision if you will, a mystical-looking creature, definitely not of this world, appears to her and tells her that she is going to have a child. Obviously, she would say, what? There's just no possible way. I've always wanted a child, but it was not in the cards for me. I'm I'm too old. I'm physically incapable of getting pregnant. In fact, the thought of it just really makes me laugh, to be honest, because that's crazy. Have to be mistaken, right? Maybe that's what she said. What would you do if you were in her situation, ladies? Believe it or not believe it? Chalk it up to some kind of crazy dream or not? What about you, men? You think your wife was already crazy, you're just barely hanging on anyways to stay up with her. (laughs) Here we go. Can we make it here? Now she's really going off the deep end. We'll ride this, this train a while. No matter what you both said or did, the dream becomes reality. She's pregnant at 90 plus years old. A woman unable to have kids all of her life. A woman who the doctor said it was impossible for her to do. But the impossible just became real. It's not normal. It's not common. I've heard of some crazy stuff in my life, but is that story really true? If it is, you got to admit one thing. That's not natural. In fact, we'll, we'll attribute a word to it, and we'll call it supernatural. Outside of the realm of the natural, the normal order of things. Have you heard the one about the guy a long time ago, who died. I heard his sisters were meeting with their loved ones and friends in their house, sitting around with the close friends that they had a few days after his death, still grieving, still hurting, being consoled by their loved ones. You know, the funeral, it was beautiful. It was a great service. Preacher did a great job. It was a wonderful time, but it still hurts. still very sad, as most of funerals are. Their brother, he's gone, never again. Will they get to spend time with him or hear his voice? But they still have the memories to cling to, and memories are great things. They've heard of a guy who even their brother knew. And this guy supposedly is walking around making blind people see, and he's supposedly casting invisible demons out of people who or look like demonics on the streets, and he's supposedly healing people of leprosy and all of these things, and and they've heard of him, and they thought, maybe, maybe can he really raise someone from the dead? I don't know, why would he, or any of that? But they knew, they called for him, and he was coming. And he showed up, and he showed up days after this man was dead, their brother, and he looks into the grave, and he says, The guy's name was Lazarus. He says, Lazarus, come out of there. The dead man gets up and walks out. Crazy story. Do you really believe that or not? If it happened, it's not natural for dead people to come to life. So we'll call that supernatural as well. Sometimes you don't know what to believe and what not to believe. Did you hear about the guys who were out fishing? 
they did this fishing thing for a living, not like me who's going to that honey hole or going to that spot to catch those fish, whatever it is. Those guys were fishing, and they had their nets down, and they're catching absolutely nothing. And this man walks up and says, hey, guys, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Okay, we're in a boat on a lake. It's pretty much the same hole on both sides. This makes no sense. But we'll do it. So they cast it on the other side. The boat almost capsizes because they catch so many fish. Crazy story. I don't know whether to believe that or not, but if it happened, it's not natural. So we'll call that supernatural as well because, you know, I don't know about you in these stories, but when most people tell me fishing stories, the fish gets a little larger every time the story is told, or we caught a few more. I don't know. There's a lot of people in here that have a story about their golf handicap being less than 10. They tee it up and they tell the story every time they put it down on the first tee. By the second hole, we're triple and doubling. How are you going to shoot that seven over, five over? Then, more look like a hundred for you. Maybe you should try bowling. But you still tell that story. Listen, we all love stories. We live our lives in stories. My favorite stories are the ones that, ones that involve me. The ones that involve me, I know, I saw, and I don't care if you believe it or not. There's some of you here that are great storytellers, and I'm just waiting for the next story you're going to tell me about what you did or what happened to you or any of those things. And maybe I can give you one too. But we love to tell stories. Our lives are stories being played out day after day after day. You don't even realize you're living in the last chapter until you look back, right? And here we are. You know, I don't know whether those stories were true or not for myself because I didn't see them. They're supernatural. I know things like that people say still go on around the world. I've never seen it. I've seen people in the hospital healed. Have you? miraculously healed. Doctors really did nothing for them. They had cancer, now they don't. Or whatever you want to throw in there. I've seen people not healed. I've seen it, we've seen it all over the board. You're here today, and I'm here today because of one of the most outrageous stories of all time. Let's be honest. You, if you're like me, grew up in Caldwell County, North Carolina, where there's a church every half mile, and you know all about this Jesus, the most polarizing figure in history. It's hard, in fact, for you to get outside of that realm and to see Jesus from other people's perspectives because you've heard it so much. Even your husband, who's home right now and cares nothing about church, knows something about Jesus or your wife or kids or whoever that is. They've been confronted with it. I would argue, in fact, that across the world... He is the most polarizing figure in history. Even so, that more people in the world know his name than the name of Elvis Presley. Or whoever you want to insert there. Michael Jackson, Elton John, name whatever. More people know about Jesus than they know about any of those people. And this story, to some, is the most outrageous story. To others... It's a story that's been on repeat. You've heard it so many times in your life that it's just on repeat. And wherever you're listening to this today, you have an opinion about this story. Who was Jesus? Why does it matter? So on, so forth. You really have to have an opinion about this because he is everywhere. To Christians, this is one of the most amazing, if not the most amazing and miraculous stories of all time. I would argue the most. It's the story of Jesus. We were told in this letter by a man named John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, about Jesus. And he sums it up in the latter part of the first century He's talking about Jesus. Jesus has died, buried, rose again, and ascended. All of the apostles are dead except for John. And here he is writing back. The book that you have here that was put together very neatly and nicely was written, but not put together yet. 
And he's writing later on in the time frame of when this was written. He wrote 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and then a book we all know at the end of our Bibles called Revelation. He was writing these letters to talk about Jesus, his, his gospel, the gospel of John, talks about Jesus right at the first. So why would he not open with the story of Jesus? So let's read together as we go into this most miraculous event in all of history, the most polarizing figure that everybody has something to do with. Let's read what John has to say about him in 1 John chapter 1. There he writes, That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life. John just said, there's a man, we're reading it now, it was written again 40 or so, 30 or 40 years after Jesus was gone, but here we are 2,000 plus years later from this man, and he says, I touched him, I saw him, he was a man. Choose you whether to believe or not. But why is this the most miraculous story of all time? Why is this more important than how you met your girlfriend or your wife or how your kids are born or how, where your kids are now or what you do for a living? Why is this the most important story of all time? Because John says, the life, verse 2, was made manifest and we have seen it and testify to it and proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And we're writing these things to you so that your joy may be complete. John says this, and this is why it's so important. Believe the story or not, John says, this Jesus is the most supreme one of all. He's supreme over your life, whether you recognize him or not. He's supreme over your husband or your wife that I just talked about, that is at home, that cares nothing about God or the church. He's supreme over them. He's supreme over your children He's supreme over all of creation that you see. John says he is supreme because of this. Number one, he is eternal. John says, that which we have heard, that which was from the beginning. Meaning, he is the bookend, the alpha and omega. Jesus, even though he was born as a baby, John said, was eternal and existed before he was born. That's hard to believe. It's not natural. Because here's this baby who was born of a virgin to top all things off. And he was born into this world. So we look at it and we say, okay, he was born by a virgin. That's crazy. But John says, no, he existed. And he was incarnate in the form of a human being. I saw him. I touched him. I saw him on the cross bleed blood, the same blood that we do. And what's crazy about that? Because he was incarnate, he was real, he was physical, he was human. The crazy part about that is, John says, he is God. Now John is telling us, because he believes it, he knows it to be a fact. It is the most miraculous thing that's ever happened, that God himself, chose to insert himself into time as we know it, the Son, Jesus Christ, living on this earth, sinless, dying, buried, rose again on the third day, ascended into heaven where he is today, and coming back. All these things, he says, is true. Choose you whether you believe the stories or not. But I stand here today because of my story, and I say this. Have you heard about the man? This was not so long ago. 
There was a man, he lived in this little town in North Carolina. He was not a good guy. He did not have his life straight, turned to everything else trying to please this inner desire. When he couldn't find alcohol to drink, would drink rubbing alcohol. Was known by everybody as the drunk and the druggie on the, on, the, on the sides in his little community. This was before Facebook and was before, you know, the internet and all these things. So it was like little circles of people, right? Well, so in this community called Balmead, this man was there. I live there now. But this man was there. This was before I was ever thought of. And he meets this lady and she's so sweet and so tiny. In fact, they name her Tiny. Nickname. He meets her and they fall in love and, and honestly it's like she just here she is and she just drags this man to church he does things to please her why would you not you fall in love with a woman you do things to please her that's what he was doing so he did but then this invisible God that we talk about all the time he said that he gave his life to this invisible God Now, you've heard that story many times, haven't you? You've heard the story of people giving their life, getting saved, you know, know, accepting Christ, however you want to put it. This man gave his life to God, if you will. This invisible God, who I'm really supposed to believe in, that 2,000 years ago, God inserted himself as a man, and all this stuff, it's pretty, pretty wild stuff, if you're really looking at it from the outside, is it not? This man then... All of a sudden, it's like a miracle happened. His life just straightens up. And he starts living differently. And he starts finding pleasure in different things. And they start this whole church thing. And they start doing what you're doing, coming because this Jesus is so polarizing, we need to go. This man and this woman, they have a daughter. And then they have two sons after that daughter. And as they're... They have these children, the daughter, she comes to know the Lord as well. And as she grows up, she meets a man, another man from Valmead. And this man from Valmead, he cares nothing about God, but goes because he loves the woman. And here he is, and I'll do this polarizing thing, whatever. And then all of a sudden, this man is saved by this invisible God that I'm supposed to believe in. And then his life is straightened up. And then they start living this life and going to church and doing these things. Not perfect, but their life is on a total different trajectory. And then that man and that woman have a daughter. And that man and that woman have a son. And that son is standing right in front of you today. All because an invisible God who you can't see, who I talk about all the time, that people pass off for flipping and call me crazy because I love him and I love the church. All because that invisible God changed the trajectory of my life two generations generations ago. Have you heard that story? Now you have. It's one of my favorites. You've probably got one too. That man is in heaven today. I believe with all my heart that invisible place that I believe exists and he is there today. He is my hero. He will always be, always be my hero. I will always think about him and love him and cherish his pictures and all his memories and one day I'm going to see him again and I believe it. How because this invisible God. Polarizing, isn't it? It really is. This story today reminds us that supernatural occurrences are all around us. This message is very simple because that is a great, even I would say the greatest of all miracles was in Jesus Christ came into this world and lived, died, was buried, the sinless life, took the cross for all these people who would choose to believe or not believe later on in life. And here he is dying, buried, and rose again on the third day. Supernatural stories are all around us. And there's many stories that we're all fascinated with. And you know, the fact John says even here, he says, We, in verse 3, we are proclaiming this to you so that you too may have fellowship. So I argue today that you are not here, even though you may have been drugged here by him or her, even though you may have came here because it was convenient for you today, you are here today because the invisible God. And you are here today because we are here around the name of Jesus Christ. 
You are not here today to see me. In fact, you probably thought Mac was here, unless you have Facebook. You are not here to see Mac. You are not here to see the band. You are not here to see any of that. You are here today because you want to see Jesus. And you thought this invisible God, you had to do something with it. Maybe you're coming just to please him or her, but we're all united today. I am, and all of you today, if you are united with me today and you here because of Jesus, say amen. That's why we're here, man. So the greatest of all miracles then is this. Yes, it's amazing prayer and and angels and demons and the end time stuff and all that crazy stuff that, that seems like crazy stories, but I believe them all like they're real. It's all amazing, but it pales in comparison because it all is central to Jesus Christ. Here's the real meat of what I'm telling you today. The other day, I was at a busy intersection, and there was these guys out there. God bless them. I am not bashing them at all. Street preachers, if you will. One thing God has not called me to, but I, God, I will go, if you want me to, is to stand on a rock at Walmart and preach to the air. You know, that's really hard for me. It's not my thing. But God called me to do it, and I'm not saying he won't. It's just hard for me. There they are here. We all know if you're driving through Lenore, you go through Smith's Crossroads, and Mr. Wilfong, pastor's out there all the time, right? God loves you, sign man. God, all over that man. He's standing out there in his, in his robe, and I love it. Everybody's beeping their horns. You know, God has called him to do that. Eh, it's tough for me. You know, I'm one of those people, I want to be a prayer warrior and one of those people that pray for you whenever you say, hey, I need prayer. But, you know, what about those times when I'm in Walmart and I'm in the aisle and I come up to somebody and they're like, uh, do you need, can you pray for me for this? And they just start busting out loud praying for you. And you're like, who's looking? I just ain't that person, yeah, you know? I'll, I'll pray for you. And I do. I want to be. But the other day I was at this intersection. Again, I'm not bashing these, these, these men out there in their suits and ties and in the sun on the side of the road. Amazing. God bless them. But they were holding a sign. And the sign said this. Literally, turn or burn, heaven or hell. Now, before I go on, when I was saved, I did not want to go to hell. I'm going to be honest with you. I believe heaven is real. I also believe hell is real. And I heard weeping and gnashing of teeth my entire life from the pulpit. Didn't want to go there. So I understand what we're talking about when we say turn or burn. I did. I turned so I didn't have to burn. Praise God. But it got me to thinking. There are so many people who have checked off the box of turn so they don't burn. But there's got to be more to this than just getting out of hell. It is a supernatural miracle that we don't have to go to hell. But there's got to be more. Because if I'm just getting saved to not go to hell, that's easy. God, I believe in you. Don't want to go to hell. Let me check the box. I just think there's more. There's got to be. I've got to offer people more than that on the back end of this thing. There's got to be some reason because... Most of us, praise God, are living cush lives, right? We, we live comfortable. We do what we want to do. You got the extra stuff. You're pretty successful. You could be really successful or, you know, you could be paycheck to paycheck, but you're still, you know, making it in life. You're much better than many people, many millions of people in the world today, and you're living this comfortable life. So what do you really have to offer me other than getting out of hell? There's got to be more. If this is the most miraculous thing that's ever happened in the history of the world, the most polarizing figure in the history of the world, there's got to be more than checking a box. So I don't want to have to go to hell. Praise God, I did check the box. Today we're sitting here, and all of us that said amen, we are here because of Jesus Christ. We live our lives differently. We have different convictions than other people. 
I am not your normal Baptist preacher. And people tell me that all the time. I don't care. I love the Lord. I'm just to be honest with you. I do. I lived my life for a long time under bondage and chains of legalism, meaning that I had to keep this straight and narrow. And if I walked off the straight and narrow, God spanked me and put me back on the straight and narrow. It's not how it goes. Or when I messed up, God put me in the corner and put the dunce out on top, said, stay over there until you set in time out long enough. That's not grace. That's not mercy. John says he's writing that we have fellowship. When you have fellowship with God, that fellowship is not broken. Nor is it strained. Yet you may be wondering, you may be living your life how you want to at this moment, but God is still there. More on that in a minute. But I want you today to strip all of the religious stuff that you think. Let's remove the type of worship we do. Let's remove the walls around this building and, and what you know as the church at Hudson First. Let's remove the presuppositions that you have, all the stuff that went into you today and, and what's on your mind and, and those types of things. Let's remove it all, even though all that stuff matters. Let's remove the fact that, you know, Baptists dunk and Methodists sprinkle and Presbyterians are quiet and, and whatever, put it all in here because just a news flash, this is amazing stuff too. When we get to heaven, we're not all going to be segregated and meet in the middle and go back to our respective corners, the Baptists here, the Presbyterians here. We're all going to be the same. Praise God. Because we're all in this fellowship. But let's remove all of that because at the root of it all, you may believe today that the end times are going to occur differently than I do. You may believe today that the end times are now. You may believe today in other different things. You may believe that you have to wear a suit and tie to church. You may believe that you can only sing hymns. You may believe that drums are not acceptable in church. You may believe all these crazy notions and all these things. But let's strip all of that away. And I want you to think today about this supernatural occurrence the most polarizing figure of all time, and nothing else. Remove the church for this moment. Church is very important. Remove it for this moment and look at Jesus. Throw out all the surrounding stuff. And my argument today is this, that the greatest of miracles are those that directly affect you and me. The greatest of all miracles is Jesus Christ. But equally as great is that I'm saved. The fact that I know Jesus and Jesus knows me is the greatest of all miracles. When I was in church, because of this story I told you, I heard this song all the time. I'm a crier. I get it from my mama. So if I cry, I just deal with it. But it says this. I wasn't there by the shores of Galilee when Jesus touched the blinded eyes and made them see. And though I did not see the empty tomb that day, I still believe, because yes, I know what Jesus did for me. I believe there is power, supernatural power, in the blood of the Lamb. And I believe there is healing in the touch of His hand. But the greatest of all miracles was when Jesus saved me. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me. You could take away the church, the having to be here on Sunday mornings, the having to go to Sunday school or life group, the making sure your kids, you drag them here all of their lives. You can take it away because let me tell you this right now. If you took it all away, I know what Jesus did for me. The benefits 
of what he did for me are the church and the life group and the kids getting to come here and him miraculously did you hear this story the other day my daughter got saved praise God him miraculously saving my daughter I had it all worked up in my head that she was gonna you know come down to the altar and lay out in front of everybody. And, you know, and her daddy's the preacher and all this. And I went to her room a long time ago, not, uh, six months ago, and she says, Dad, we were talking about it. She said, Daddy, I got saved a year ago. I prayed it when I was in the bed. <laughs> Jesus miraculously saved her. Now we're walking together through all the benefits of that. On Monday, Thursday service, I got to serve her communion, if you were there, for the first time in her life. What a benefit. I'm talking through baptism with her because I just don't want to throw her in the pool, you know, so she don't understand what's going on or she thinks that water saved her or anything. But she's going to come and she's going to be baptized when it's her time. Yes, I know what Jesus did for me and he's reciprocated it into the next generation. That's the greatest of all miracles. And I pray all the time whether it may look it, whether I'm the worst seemingly parent in the world, whether I do devotions with my kids or not all the time. We fail miserably in our house, but we still pray. It's still on our minds. God, you're going to save our boys. God, save our boys. God, save our boys. Because, yes, I know what Jesus did for me. The benefits of this church thing are awesome, but it's all because this supernatural event that happened in your life. Everyone has to choose what they do with Jesus. And then we muddy it up along the way. But strip it all out. Today, you have to know. You have to know who he is. John writes, that which we have seen, verse 3, And heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you too may have fellowship with us. And what is that fellowship in? Next line. It's what I've been talking about. I just wanted to read it at the end of my point. And indeed, our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then verse 4. There's got to be more than turning and not burning. And we are writing these things so your joy may be complete. It's worth it. It's about your joy, not your happiness. Happiness changes. We've said it many times in this church. God is not totally concerned with your happiness, but you have joy in Him, complete joy. So I tell you today, do I have to worry about going to hell? No. So get out of hell? Yes. The benefit of knowing what Jesus did for me. Do I have a community that I can lean on, that I can go to, that I can learn from, that I can, that I can talk to, that can pray for me and I pray for them too? Yes. It's called Hudson First. What a gift. What a gift. It's not a drudgery or a thing that I have to do every Sunday. It is a gift to me. I also get to experience real life. Everything is better God's way. And he says, I'm writing these things to you that your joy may be complete. You know what that means? That means that you get to live in this life, as Paul writes it, in the real life. Living with the fruits of the Spirit that only believers have. Only believers can experience, and that are these, real love, complete joy, total peace, patience, kindness, goodness, long-suffering, gentleness, faithfulness, meekness or modesty, and self-control. And you get to live those in the power of God. And the same power that rose this Jesus from the grave, this invisible God who made himself visible in the form of his son, and as he lived on this earth, God the Son for us died and was buried and rose again on the third day, and he's ascended today. You cannot see him, but the same power that did all of that miraculously in the greatest of all miracles of all 
all time to me and will always be lives right here. You can't see it inside there. I can't either. Sometimes I don't even feel it. But it is the greatest of all miracles. Is that we have fellowship with God. Jesus knows you. And you know him. So, supernatural things aplenty. Stories all over the place. You don't know what to believe or what to believe. But take it all away. And if you know what Jesus did for you, then you know the greatest of all miracles. Let's pray. God, we thank you for this day. A day that you just reminded us with a simple message at the end of a great series (sighs) that you are God, we are your people, and that the greatest of all miracles is that you sent your son into this world and not only stopped there, but you saved us. And that's why we're here today. That's why we worship you. And so I praise you today Knowing that I am not a perfect man, I am not the model man for anyone to look at like Paul said. Knowing that my marriage is not the model marriage. Knowing that my parenting skills are not the best. Knowing all these things, but still trusting in an invisible God. I'm praying to you right now and believe that you're right here with me as I speak. So I trust you today. I trust you with what you're doing in people's hearts here and what you're doing in people's lives. We all look different. We do different things. We come from different backgrounds. But God, we're all here for Jesus. Help us to get over our trivial things and just always be reminded that we know you and you know us. So we praise you today, God, for the supernatural power that was given to us as a gift of salvation. We praise you today, God, that you are God and we are your people. Holy Spirit, I trust you to do a work that only you can do. Move in people's hearts. In Jesus' name, amen.